Many of us have, and most of us, have probably heard the golden rule our entire lives. It, uh, <clears throat> how it became known as the golden rule, uh, there are a couple of questions about it. Some people believe its origin comes from uh, the fact that gold being the most precious of metals and this becomes, and this rule is the highest of these rules and as far as it calls us to service and we'll see it contrasted with other rules uh, a little bit later. Others believe that there was a Roman emperor named Alexander Severus <clears throat> who had this verse engraved in gold in his throne room. And so some people believe the expression came there. Either way, we're familiar with it. And it's one of these texts that um, it's not really hard to understand. There aren't problems as far as drawing out the meaning. But if we're honest, there's a, many times a great deal of difficulty with living it out and doing it. And so um, as we think through this together, this golden rule in Matthew chapter 7, and that we need to understand that Matthew 7 and verse 12, which is what we know is the golden rule, is rooted in something far deeper. And that one helps us to understand the other. And not treat Matthew 7, 12 simply as a proverb, but as it is a point that he is making and drawing in this sermon that he is building up to. And so, as we think about this particular study this morning, I want us to just break it into two parts. Verses 7 through 11, we see a golden promise. A golden promise. And in verse 12, we see the golden rule. And hopefully we'll see how one feeds the other. And so, as we think about this, <clears throat> this golden promise to begin, in Matthew 7 and verse 7, we are given a command. And that command comes <clears throat> to us as three imperatives. Ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened. So ask, seek, and knock. Both, all three of which are present imperatives. That is, there's something we're to can do continuously. And the imperative, he's telling us to do this on a continual basis. Now, if you look at these words, there's a progression in them, okay? There is a progression in them. And Miss, I think my slides are out of order again. I think that one that just came up is supposed to be at the very bottom. But anyway, we'll get back to that in a minute. <clears throat> there is a progression in these words, ask, seek, and knock, okay? So first is the idea of you're kind of sitting still and asking. The second is that you're, kind of, you're getting up and you're moving and you're seeking something out. And then the third is you have found it and you're knocking on the door seeking entrance. And so there seems to be this sense of progression that comes from these particular terms. And what God is telling us through his son here is that we are to seek God. And in particular, in this context, he's talking about prayer. That seems to be the implication. That we ask and it will be given and that gives each of those three imperatives are given three indicatives, which tells us what will happen. Because if you ask, it will be given to you. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, it will be open to you. It's the promise of an answer. But what we need to understand, and I think we all do understand this very well, this is not pie in the sky idea of I ask God for, I don't know, Let's say I ask him to drop me a tub of money right here. That's not going to happen because that's not the idea behind the command it's given or the promise that is attached to it, right? In this particular sermon, you have to interpret it in the subject matter of the whole sermon. And in this sermon, as you look at, their prayer, at, at the prayer, the model prayer that Jesus gave, one of the things he said was, give us this day our daily bread. He's talking more about necessities and spiritual needs, like forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, than he is talking about in general wide blanket statements that you ask God for something and he will hand it over to you. You have to keep it within the flow of the sermon and interpret it that way. And even if we do not get the very thing for which we asked, as one writer put it, that I read many years ago that has proved very helpful for me is that God gives us in the answer to our prayer what we would have asked for if we knew what he knew. 
He will always give an answer to our prayer. It may not be the answer we're looking for, but it is the answer that we need. And it's the one that we would ask for if we could see reality and see everything the way that he sees it. And so we're thankful to be able to have those promises <clears throat> from God. Now, this then is attached to a specific line of reasoning that God answers prayer. And the first part of it is basically look at God's track record. Okay? Look at God's track record. Look at what he has done. For everyone who asks, receives. This is not just being repetitive for the sake of trying to be repetitive. He's driving at a point. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. That is, as you look back at the past and you look at the way God dealt with people, you have found this to be true, that God answers prayer. This is very similar to wisdom literature. Okay, So wisdom literature, think of something like Proverbs. And many times in wisdom literature, the statement is generally true. Okay, It's not a hard and fast rule, but it's generally true. For an example, as I think we've cited before, Proverbs 22, 6, raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Is that a 100% hard and fast rule? No. That's not the way wisdom literature works. Is it generally true? Yeah. Generally, they will turn out in a way that they've been influenced through the way that they have been raised. That's generally true. And so what he's saying here is very similar to that. And so if you look in the past when the people of God have asked and they have sought him and they have knocked on the door, he has given to them. He has responded to them. They have received and they have been admitted into what it is that they desired for the work of God. <clears throat> so God's track record, number one, shows us that. And that has to do with God's faithfulness. God is not asking us to trust him blindly. Okay? He gives us the evidence to show that he is faithful. And that's why in, in letters like 1 Thessalonians where he talks about the resurrection, he says, faithful is the one who promised you, who also will do it. The point being, I gave you my word and I plan on doing it. You can look at the past and see that when I make promises, I keep promises. And God is trustworthy in that regard. But then he builds the argument from the lesser to the greater about God's superior fatherhood. And he uses two simple illustrations. He says this, Or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Now the stones in Palestine look very much like their loaves of bread that they cook. <clears throat> okay? Or, he says in verse 10, if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. Now obviously these are hyperboles they're meant to show the ridiculous nature of it right it's an implied negative answer dad i need something to eat well here's a rock i want something to eat i want a fish well okay all i can rumble up for you is a snake no matter and when he gets to that point in verse 11 he says this if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him so he argues from the lesser to the greater if you as a parent with all of your faults none of us no parent is perfect but if us in our imperfections we know how to give good things to our children and delight in giving those things to our children if that's true of us on a smaller scale of imperfect people how much more is it true of a perfect God at the highest scale and so <clears throat> he is driving this point and wants us to, and there's a, something we need, to not, we need not miss here, and that is that he's calling on us to consider who God is. Because the, the connotation that a lot of people have of God is one that's extremely negative. It's almost the way that people viewed idolatry throughout history. That God is some kind of a cosmic giant, you have to keep him off of your back, and you have to give him things if you want to get things from him. But here he's painted as a loving father who actually delights to give to his children. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure most parents, unless they're struggling with some major problems, which is certainly true. But most parents actually enjoy seeing their kids be happy. 
You know, Christmas is fun when you're a kid, but it's a lot more fun when you're a parent. When you get to see their eyes light up, and they, especially when they get a little older and they start understanding and kind of get caught up in the season and the atmosphere of things. It puts a smile on your face to give to them. If we and our imperfections can do that, how much more does God smile as he gives good things to us and gifts us every single day of our lives? So that's a golden promise. God said, ask. I'll give it to you. I'll take care of you. I know how to take care of you. I have the resources to take care of you. Now, <clears throat> from that foundation, we get then the golden rule. The golden rule is rooted in the golden promise. So, <clears throat> And as a matter of fact, one actually fuels the other, okay? And so this is kind of like the pinnacle. The sermon is coming here, and we'll see in just a minute, that the body of the Sermon on the Mount is concluding in verse 12. 13 through 27 is kind of his conclusion, or his invitation, if you will. And we'll study it um, at a different time. But you see that it is connected to it, depending upon your translation, verse 12 will probably begin... The ESV begins with so. Your translation may say therefore. That's basic grammar, isn't it? What does it do? It attaches itself to what precedes. Okay? So, therefore, the fulfillment of the golden rule finds itself in imitating the God of the golden promise. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we've already seen this in chapter 5 when he talks about loving your enemies. Listen to what he says. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. You do good to people who don't do good to you. Why? Because that's exactly what God does. God does not only do good to people who love him and obey him, he also does good to people who don't want anything to do with it. And if, verses 7 through 11, we have a God who gives to us graciously and enjoys the giving to us graciously, and then with that statement he says, so or therefore, it informs what it means to practice the golden rule. Because practicing the golden rule is imitating the very nature of God himself. Now, <clears throat> when we look and we think about why it is called, why so many people have called it golden through the years, you look and you study world religions. <clears throat> you study their writings, their teachings, their sayings. What Jesus says here is not actually, in one sense I should say, is not actually uncommon in religious writings. I want to give you just kind of a smattering of things to listen to. This one comes from the nation and some of the religions in India. It says, one should never do something to others that one would regard as an injury to one's own self. Don't, miss, don't treat a person in a way that you would regard, if you were treated that way, as an injury. Proverbs 24, 29 says something similar. Do not say, I will do to him as he has done to me. I will pay the man back for what he has done. The idea of getting revenge. An old Jewish deuterocanonical book named Tobit says this. What you hate, do not do to anyone. Tobit 4, 15. Sextus said this. What you do not want to happen to you, do not do it yourself either. What you do not want to happen to you, do not do it yourself either. Seneca the Younger said, treat your inferior as you would wish your superior to treat you. Or an old Hindu saying, one should never do to another which one regards as injurious to one's own self. Now when you look at those statements... When you look at those statements, 
there are a couple of things that really stand out. One of which, especially the statement by Seneca the Younger, treat the inferior as you wish your superior would treat you. That could be, not necessarily, but it could be interpreted in a sense almost with kind of a selfish motive that by treating them this way, hopefully my boss will see it and treat me this way. It could be. The one thing that is certain about all of these statements is that they are negative in their scope. What did they say? Do not do to others what you don't want done to yourself. The thing that makes Jesus' statement different is that it's not negative in his nature. It's not just saying refrain from doing harm to people. It's proactive and it's positive in its direction. Okay, Jesus says and reframes the discussion by saying not what you don't want other people to do to you, don't do to them. He actually says go on the offensive and what you want other people to do to you, you do to them. There's a world of difference in those two things. You know, it takes some restraint, it takes some difficulty to be able to not do to a person something that we may even think is due to them, or to refrain from hurting a person. But perhaps the hardest thing in the world is to actively do good to a person. And that's what Jesus is calling for here, the proactive seeking of good. So the implications of it are this. Number one, it begins inwardly. He says, whatever you wish others would do to you. That's an inward contemplation. This is how I would like to be treated. This is dignity. This is kindness. This is goodness. This is what makes people feel loved. Inwardly, this is what I think that should this is what I think should happen. And then Jesus says, okay, now take that inward thought and move it outward and do it to other people. Don't just think about doing good, actually do it. Now, why is that so difficult? Well, at one level I think it's not all that difficult, and the other level I think it is extremely difficult. Let me ask you this. When Jesus said, so whatever you wish others would do to you, who, is, who are the others? Who are the others? I don't really see any type of qualification in this statement seems to be pretty straightforward that the others are pretty much everybody else that's not you so this might be easy in a sense to do good to my spouse my children extended family or friends or as Jesus would say in Matthew 5 doing good to those who love you that's normal even Gentiles tax collectors other people they do that it's not hard to do good to a person or to love a person who loves you back The difficult side is how do you do good to people who hurt you? How do you do good to people who hate you? How do you do good to people that they may be living in such a way that we would disagree? How do we treat those people? Let me just explore one hot button cultural issue. What about the LGBTQ plus movement? Homosexuality, transgenderism, things along those lines. When I hear Christians talk about this, 
Sometimes all I can hear is anger and rage. Let me ask you something. Why is it that the rule of Matthew 7, 12 does not apply to that person? Why, why doesn't it apply to that person? Let me ask you further. <clears throat> Those who have such strong opinions about people in this movement, and let me tell you something, if you're looking for me to agree with certain lifestyles, that's not going to happen. God has spoken very clearly on things. But this is something I know. They have not ceased to be human beings who are loved by God. And they will never cease to be human beings who are loved by God. When someone rages against homosexuality, one of the things I want to ask them is, how many gay people do you actually know? How many gay people have you ever actually had a conversation with? And I don't mean to tell them that they're wrong. I mean to actually just get to know them as a person. Because they're still a person. People say, why would I do that? How would you like it if somebody came raging at you over something without even bothering to get to know you first? All things that you would that men would do to you, do also to them. What about a person who struggles with transgender issues? Gender dysphoria. That's not something that's made up. It's not something that people are just doing to try and get attention. Now, we like to say that because it alleviates us in our minds of responsibility. We don't have to treat them like a human being and, you know, they're just playing games. I can guarantee you, look at the suicide rates. It's not a game. And what I have also found is that a number of people who are really outspoken on these issues, they tend to change their tune when somebody in their family starts struggling with it. Don't ever for a second think your kids are above falling into these types of problems. I wish I could tell you my children would never struggle with either of these issues, but I cannot. You can't prevent. It's about a struggle with sin. And if our job is to bring people in with the gospel, to bring people in, we're going to have to treat people the way Jesus told us to treat people. So many people, you find out a person may be homosexual, and people act as if somehow it's some kind of a transmittable disease. Like, I can't shake your hand because somehow it'll make me this way. And then... <laughs> As one person said, and I'll never forget it, as long as I live, a girl who had grown up in that church, she came back for a friends and family day, and they said, what is she doing here? That's the equivalent of looking at a person with a heart attack and saying at the ER, why are you here? Where are they supposed to be? But when we start treating people and we put that label on people, it dehumanizes them for us and so we can dismiss them 
and treat them as subhuman. But when we look at people the way that God looks at people, that is an image bearer of God for whom Christ died. And I've also noticed something else. The same people who are all about anti-LGBTQ, they got no problem shaking the hand of a person that sleeps around with everybody that walks. That's acceptable now. All things you would that men would do to you, do also to others. And if that doesn't strike deeply within us, then think about it this way. All things you would that your your kids would be treated in a way if they struggled with it. Whatever the struggle is, the way you would want your kids to be treated, treat other people's kids the same way. That's why this command is in ways easy. Because you love those who love you. But in other ways, is extremely difficult. Especially when you put labels on people and someone says, I just can't do it. I would just say this, I'm thankful God does not feel that way. Because in Romans 5, 6 through 11, there are <clears throat> four terms used to describe us and our sinful lost ways we were weak ungodly sinners and enemies and how did God respond to people who were weak and ungodly and sinners and enemies Christ died for them and justified them and saved them and reconciled them it's exactly what he did And so this particular section serves as a conclusion for the entire sermon body. In chapter 5, in verse 17, the body of the sermon really begins to take shape and move. You know, you have an introduction, you have a body, and you have a conclusion. The body of the sermon begins in 517 when Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then you see that same phrase repeated again here at 712. When he says, whatever you wish others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You see that phrase repeated twice? The law and the prophets, that's called an inclusio or an envelope. That's the phrase you use to begin it. It's the phrase you use to conclude it. And then you move into your conclusion. And this phrase is only found three times in Matthew. 517, 712, and 2240. When Jesus is asked what is the great command in the law, and he said to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself, and on these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. And so what has Jesus been driving at in this sermon? All of the statements that have come before, what's he getting at? The golden rule. What you wish others would do to you, do also to them. This is everything that the law and the prophets have been talking about. Every one of those commands that sometimes are treated as if they don't matter, inconsequential, or how do they relate to anything? They relate to God was trying to form in us and in them a love for him and a love for people. And thus it serves as the law's summary. The question we have to ask ourselves is, has it been created in us? Golden promises from God are not just things that we use to take advantage of ourselves. Golden promises are roots by which we bear fruit in showing the same thing to other people. That's what the golden rule is. Showing people the love of God. 
the way that we have been shown it. And that promise for not just answering prayer, but for salvation is still available today. If a person comes to Jesus with a penitent faith, confessing Christ to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins, the promise is still there. That golden promise to forgive us is there. Or as New Testament Christians who have been unfaithful, who've been not what we should be, that golden promise is still there. And may God help us as people who have received golden promises to practice the golden rule. We can help you this morning. Let us know as we stand and sing this song.